Right. Yeah, so. That's it. All right, so we should have a short class tonight. Sorry for those who missed last week. It was a longer one. We're doing two short topics tonight. One is private trusts, companies, and Bahamas executive entities. So anyone could tell me what's the difference between the two? Well, a uh, private, go ahead. private trust company would be a company that acts as trustee for um, like a related group of trusts or companies that are all within one family, right? Correct, correct. So we know that PTC are governed by the Central Bank of the Bahamas and the PTC um, regulations. So PTC is limited by shares or by guarantee. The minimum share capital or guarantee is $5,000. And the company itself can be either an IBC or Companies Act company. You must have two shareholders and two directors. And if it's an IBC, one shareholder and one director. The thing about a PTC is very flexible and it could be, it could be held by a foundation. Trustees are of an authorized purpose trust or by individual or corporate shareholders. So you could already begin to see the structure in your head. So you would have the foundation at the top and the PTC underneath, or you could have an authorized purpose trust and then a PTC under underneath. So whenever you have a PTC, it must have a registered representative and the registered representative has certain functions. First, they have to be licensed either by the central bank or by whom. The financial corporate services providers. Right. Act. Mm -hmm. And PTCs are exempt from business license. And in order to, to create this PTC, you must have a designated person. That could be one person or more than one person. And one of the restrictions of having a PTC is that you cannot solicit or conduct trust business. You're only allowed to deal with your family trust structures. The memo and arts of the PTC has to stipulate that is acting as trustee only for a trust or trust created by the designated person or persons as stated in the designating instrument. So the instrument itself, the designated instrument contains the designated persons and the individuals who created the trust and they have to be completed by the PTC. If you have more than one designated person, they have to be blood relative of the other designated persons. And you know, in, in this environment now, all KYC is required on all of these persons. Sorry, can you repeat that about the blood relatives? Are you saying that all the designated person must be related? Yeah, they have to be related. To the beneficiaries of the trust? No. If there is more than one designated person. Oh, then they, have they all have to be, have to be yeah, related. Yes, they all have to be related. If more than one designated person. If more than one, yes. But the designated person doesn't have to be related to the family that's the it's acting as that the PTC is acting trustee of, right? Mm, no, not really. Wait, say that again. I missed that. The designated person. No, her. I missed her question. Oh, she asked if the designated person have to be related to the beneficiaries. Okay. And the answer was no. No, because the designated person, all persons are the family members. And a designated person can also be someone who, 
who is deceased. Does it have to be a natural person? It can't be an entity, right? For the designated person? Right. right. No, normally it is a person. So all PTCs must have a registered representative and they are licensed by the central bank or under the FCSP. The registered representative can act as a secretary, a director, or an agent to the PTC. And they have to make sure that the PC, PTC is established for the lawful purpose and operates as a PTC. So the registered representative must have a minimum share capital of 50,000. Of course, it has to be properly constituted and it has to maintain records of the identity of the settler, any person providing assets subject to the trust that's going to be administered by the PTC. The designated person or persons, the protector of the trust. And any person who has a vested interest in such trust. So the registered representative has to notify the central bank if the PTC no longer meets the requirements for business license exemption. And of course, they have to provide with other additional information that the inspector needs. The registered representative also has to notify the inspector if they cease to act as a registered representative of PTC or if there are any changes in address of the PTC. The registered representative is required to obtain an annual certificate of compliance from the directors of the PTC. And that in that they would declare that they have not undertaken any business as trustee for a trust or trust other than for the designated persons. And adding to that, that the directors have acted honestly and in good faith and in the best interest of the PTC. So the registered representative has to maintain at his office, the memo and arts, the designating instrument, the resume of the special director, the trust instrument for each trust, the acknowledgement from the settler of each trust, and of course the client profile forms. And then like I said before, the registered representative also has to verify the identity of the designated person and the protector. And that also includes the vested beneficiaries of the trust. The registered representative also has a duty to report any suspicious transactions to the FIU. Now all PTCs must have a special director and this is a person who has um, a background in trust administration, law, finance, accounting, or investments. So they have to be of good repute and it's always recommended that a PC, PTC have at least one officer who may be a secretary. Now that secretary could be a company or it can be an individual. So as I said before, PTCs are restricted from carrying on business for any other business other than as trustee for the trust or the group of trusts, which were created by the designated person or persons. They cannot solicit trust business. So let me ask you, what do you think some of the advantages are of establishing a PTC? What do you think some of the benefits are? I mean, is it privacy? Because technically your stuff doesn't have to be like filed at the company's registry in the sense that it's not, so it's not like public record. Mm -hmm. So it's not like how we did the foundation last week. Right. Right. 
So it gives you, it gives you confidentiality. That's one advantage. Another advantage. What's another advantage? Um, I guess they wouldn't have any sort of like annual fees. To yes, be paid lower to like the registrar. Mm -hmm. Lower costs. Third advantage is the family will have more control over their over their administration of their trusts. Another advantage. Doesn't it lower the 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 um the trustee's exposure to liability? Um how? Because don't forget now the, the PTC itself acts as a trustee over their assets. Versus if you had this under discretionary trust, the liability, the potential for legal exposure is greater. You're only just doing the family trust under the instruction of the family members. So would the family members themselves normally be the directors of the PTC? Yes. Mm -hmm. or, or what if... Um... What if you as a financial institution provided uh, nominee directors? Mm. Well, you could, but normally you still would have a family member because that's the whole purpose of having a PTC. Because they want to manage it themselves. Right. That's why they always ask that you have this special director. So there's someone there who knows something about trust business. So what you're saying is that, so, so let me just make sure I understand correctly. A PTC uh -huh. basically is the trust, like when we were discussing trust in our previous class, the uh -huh. trustee in this case would be the PTC. But yes. in this case, the PTC provides you less the PT, the ptc provides you with more like limited liability is that what you're trying to say compared to like just an individual person yes so the pc ptc itself acts as a trustee of a specific trust that's how it's structured or it could even be a group of trusts the difference between the ptc and say um, Gone Bank and Trust, offering trust services, is that the PTC can be tailored to suit that family. Versus if you go to Gone or any other institutional, you have to fit into the, into the structures that they have created. The PTC, you could create it the way you want it to be done. Would it also be a benefit um, from a reporting aspect in terms of, say, uh, the beneficial ownership act and stuff and that sort of mm. reporting requirement because it would be you know owned by a trust which is also um with a licensed trustee i'm assuming would be the financial institution as well regulated yeah. by the secretary so that you wouldn't have to put your name individually yeah so you will have so you will have on the top of the the PTC is the trustee. Yeah. Okay, and then you have the trust. Right. But for reporting requirements, wouldn't you have to put the owner of the um, of the PTC if they're drilling back? No. Yes, and then and, and they would be trustees. Right. So then you would just mm -hmm. have to put the name of the financial institution, thereby eliminating the need to provide all of the personal information. Right. right of the trust. Yeah. Right.
I'm trying to see if. Yeah, as far as I understood it with the Beneficial Ownership Act, you have to upload if you if there's a PTC in place, that's where you would stop. So you would just put the information on the PTC itself and you wouldn't go back to the beneficiaries or like the owners of the PTC. OK, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it, it really is really done for protection and for confidentiality and then also for succession. Just don't forget now a PTC, a PTC is incorporated either under the Companies Act or the IBC Act. So of course it has perpetual succession. And then, then, then the Bahamas itself has a part in it by taking on that role as being the registered representative and carrying out the functions that are required by the legislation. So let's go to the B. You heard about the B? the Bahamas executive entity. This was my first time dealing with um, or reading up on. Oh, do you say they're new? Yeah. Well, so like, this, is, this is my first time interact, like coming into like coming into reading about it. These, okay, all right. So the B, the Bahamas executive entity works along with the PTC. So it is a legal entity. And it doesn't have any beneficial owners. It's really created to perform executive function. So you would create uh, an executive entity and then you would state that it was established for, to perform executive functions. So you act like a director, act like an officer. Yeah, I haven't had many, um, many interactions with those. The one that I did, it, it like dissolved as quickly as it was formed. A B? Why? I can't remember. This was years ago, but it was almost like just as quickly as it came, like it seemed like a great idea and then they didn't need it anymore. I don't know. Mm. Yeah, I normally haven't come across any. It was linked to a charity, if I remember correctly, or a foundation. Okay, because you could use a B um, to hold shares. So the B can hold the shares of the PTC. Yeah, I don't think a PTC was involved in that one. And so if you, if you hold the shares of the PTC by the B, then you don't need a purpose trust. So the one you had is probably a PTC and above it was a purpose trust. Because you said it was for charitable purposes. If I remember correctly. Yeah, because it could be either way. This is a long time ago. And so by using the structure like this with the B over the PTC, you eliminate costs. So the B has many distinctive features, which make it an attractive corporate vehicle for executive functions. That's all it is. And we normally make it use it in- attractive, you said, for corporate functions? Yeah, it's a, for corporate vehicles, an attractive corporate vehicle for executive functions. Like I told you, a B could be um, a director, It could provide administrative functions, supervisory functions, fiduciary functions. Can it do all at the same time or does it have to have one, one specified? No, it could, it could put all of that, you know. But I mean, normally it depends, but normally in a structure you'll only see one B. Have they really taken off? 
Not really, not as far as I know. Not not to say like how the IBCs are popular, no. Right. So I haven't had, like I said, many encounters with them, but when I remember when it was, um, when the act was passed, it seemed like it was going to be like the next best thing. But I guess, uh, yeah, it's just a, it's, it's, it, yeah. They do it as a, as a kind of structuring, but I guess it depends on the client because, you know, every one of these companies form costs money. Yeah. So it only could perform executive functions. Um, well, okay, let's just say the features of it, limited liability is similar to a foundation. It has no shareholders. It can contract with third parties. It can sue and be sued. It has no minimum capital. And it only has to maintain assets to carry out its executive functions. It can hold shares, securities, or ownership interests in a legal entity. So would the, the key feature of it be that there's no shareholders? It would just be, what is it? The charter documents? No, what is it called? No, but the, the, see the key thing about the B is that it's, it provides enhanced fiduciary services. So like what it's trying to do is safeguard the structure. Let, let me let you draw it. Put a, a put put a put a box and put Bahamas executive entity. Underneath that box, put a private trust company, PTC, and then put a trust underneath that. So, the B has no trustees required for a B. It can hold the shares of the PTC and is responsible for central governance because it's going to govern that whole structure. And there's no beneficial owner for the B. And then if you look at the PTC, the PTC board is family connected. It must have a registered representative and it have to observe all the recording of the decisions. Underneath the trust, because you know the trust has assets, you could either have an operating company or you could have other assets. So only thing the B is doing is holding and governing the PTC. It's just a structure to reduce costs. And it also helps you not to have one of those um, banks and trust companies, big ones, like all of the Gone and all the rest of them. So it eliminates all of that cost. And so the PTC can function privately by the family trust. So you understand how hard what it looks like now. A B at the top. Then go down, put the PTC, go down, put a trust. And then under the trust, you could have an operating company or you could just have assets that have to be administered. Like maybe paintings, cars, yacht, whatever. The bill just hold the shares and govern the PDC. So really what the B does is it simplifies the operations and then reduce the cost of the whole structure because you don't have an, uh, 
an actual institutional trust company overseeing this process, which can be quite costly. So those who weren't with us last week, you had more time to read your notes. So what's the difference between a foundation and a PTC? I see Darcy is on the line, Charlize is on the line. They can help us. What's the difference between a foundation and a PTC? Uh, good evening. Good evening. How are you? I'm okay. And yourself? Oh, we're here. We're fine. Excellent. Um, um a foundation has uh no members or shareholders. What do they have? Say it again. What do they have? I was just backing up the follow-up question. <laughs> so I didn't first the go ahead. First, the foundation is a separate legal entity. Okay. Okay, so go from there. Let me help you. The Hello, founder, well. the founder. He, he dedicates his property for a purpose. Purpose could be family or it could be charitable. What else? Maybe for some estate planning as well. Yes, he uses it for that, yes. And um, I guess uh, establishing charities. Mm -hmm. It has trusts. It acts well. It acts as a trustee. Who acts as a trustee? The foundation. Yeah, for trusts. No, foundation trust is two different things. A foundation is a foundation. A trust is a trust. For um, I I know of a transaction where I suspected it was used to preserve families family wealth. Uh huh. So don't forget now, normally the foundation when it's created by the founder and the assets then belong to the foundation. But remember now, the primary purpose is to carry out the wishes of the founder. And those wishes are settled in the charter. Right. So the foundation could buy and sell assets as long as whatever they do is in the context of, of the family wealth. So you could, you could take the assets in a foundation and you could use it to pay children's school fees. Um, you could use it to buy other assets. You can do it whereby you produce income. You could use it the whole, um, shares of companies. 
So a foundation itself, because it's a legal entity, it is like a company. Right. I've I've seen where a foundation was a, a shareholder for a company. Of course, we had to get um, some additional information on them, but I did see where that was something that was, was ha that happened. Mm -hmm. So, like a company, it has offices to make decision and to make sure to do the the day to day work. The same way a, a director would do it in a company. And if there are no offices, who runs it? Who runs the foundation? The founder? The foundation council. Oh, council. The council. And then don't forget now, just as in a settler directed trust, the founder of a foundation can reserve powers to himself. And those powers are similar to what, what the set law would have if he retained such provision in the trustee. So he normally would ask for the power to appoint and remove officers or appoint and remove foundation council members. Or he could do, um, do it whereby he can veto the descriptions of the foundation's assets. Versus on the trust side, the set law and a settler directed trust, he instructs the trustees how to invest the assets. He can also retain for himself the power to appoint and remove trustees. Normally, as in the foundation, the, the, he could keep the powers to appoint or remove a foundation council. On the trust side, the set law normally leaves the removal of trustees to the protector. So now let me ask, go back to Darcy and Chalisa. What's the difference between a trust and a PTC. Should I start you off? Yes, please. <laughs> So let me start off first. A, a PTC. Trust. Okay, start. Go ahead. Go ahead. You can go. Sorry, I, I didn't realize you're talking. Go ahead. No, you can go, PTC. Oh, Lord. <laughs> <laughs> a PTC is a company. Uh, it's formed. Okay, I had my notes mixed up. This, it was formed uh -huh. to act as a trustee. It, that is act as a trustee for a specific purpose. Okay. All right, so a PTC is established under the Companies Act or IBC Act, limited by shares or by guarantee, is governed under the Banks and Trust Companies Regulations Act and its regulations. Versus a trust, a trust is a legal arrangement where the set law transfers his legal and equitable interests in his property for a trustee to hold, manage, and administer for the benefit of the beneficiaries of whom he may be one. That's a big difference between the two. Give me a second difference between a PTC and a trust. As a, as it is a PTC, and it and, and it's um, under the Companies Act or IDC Act, it will have all of the directors and officers as any other 
incorporated company. Um, as for the trust, like you said, it's a legal arrangement. So the, the rules and responsibility won't be that of a director or officers and beneficial ownership, but it'll be like you said, the settler, um, the trustee, and you said protectors as well? Yeah, protectors, yes. So okay, what are the differences Go ahead. There are certain obligations that's um, required under for PTCs. Like um, I heard you mentioning earlier about, of course, if there is any suspicious transaction or they can report to the FIU, just like any other company. Um, they have regulatory requirements as well and mm -hmm. licensing under financial and corporate service provider mm -hmm. more <laughs> darcy you can jump in darcy darcy or shalisa they were missing last week so that's they could me, jump in that was me talking just now that's giving Darcy a chance to, to put in oh. one or two. I won't say all. Oh. Oh, 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 God. You leave him by himself? <laughs> no, I started off. Take it off. Take it away, Darcy. So as you were summarizing just now, PTC must have a registered representative. Okay. And that registered representative has regulatory requirements. He has to maintain certain documents in his office. So let's compare that to a trust. Do we have such a feature in the trust? Um, all I know is that the trustee, trustee must maintain certain documents. Yes. What no. are they? Oh, I they hear yes, trustee, and I hear no. No, the trustee has to have certain documents. They have to have copies of like all of the like um prop like the trust documents. So like you have to have a copy of the trust document as well as the um supporting documents. So any property or assets that may be in the trust. So that, that, that the trustee has to verify that those documents are accurate and, mean, and, and actually keep record of those. And the financial accounting, remember? Yes, that too. Yes, the financial, yes. He needs to have those. Right. So in this instance, on, okay. under the PTC, the registered representative is required to have these and under the trust, the trustee is required to have certain documents. Now, it, it also says that under the trust, under the trustee act, beneficiaries are only allowed to see certain documentation. What's the requirement under PTC? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? You broke up for a second. Oh, okay. I said under the trustee act, the beneficiaries of a trust are entitled to see certain documents. What is required under the PTC for beneficiaries. Can they see everything? They're required to have the, the annual compliance um, certificate, the PTC. Yes. Stating that. The director. Um, the company has not undertaken any business as, um, as a trustee. Mm -hmm. Other than. Um, for the for the that for the designated person, right? At all, he must also have a fidelity yeah. bond, and he also has to have an annual audit done. So there has to be an acknowledgement that has to be completed for each trust. Yeah, acknowledging that these things have been done. Mm -hmm. A private an um, annual audit. Right. So under the PTC. You have to have one special director with all those skills. What's required under a trust? If you were to compare it. Mm -hmm. See if, see if, see if um, 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 Danielle could help you. Any one of the two Daniels. Uh, what a trust must have? Yes. The trust must have a settler, beneficiaries, and um, the objects. Mm -hmm. But I'm looking at this special director who have to have good reputation. 
and these years of experience. That's what that's what required on the PTC. Compare that to a trust. What comes to your mind? A licensed financial institution as a trustee. No, no. You mean this the protector? Is a, no. No, not the protector. Listen again. The PTC has to have a special director, good reputation, and he must have knowledge and experience. What comes to your mind? A director. Not under trust. The trustee. The trustee has to have certain knowledge and understanding, eh? No, we're talking about the investment advisor, remember? The trustee has the right to delegate and employ an agent. And when he employs that agent to carry out those functions, they have to meet the criteria in the trustee act. They have to be of good, good reputation and they have to have all of the experience to go with what they're going to do. Remember now? A trustee is allowed to employ an agent. Yeah. What's the difference between a B and a regular company? Why call it a B? Why add, why, why take a company and then register it under this act? With a regular company, you need a shareholder. Say it again. With a regular company, you would need a shareholder, but with the B, you don't, right? Mm hmm And if its purpose is only to um, perform executive functions, right? Uh-huh. But it still can sue and be sued. Yeah, it has no capital. Legal. But it's still a legal entity. Right. Established by a charter. It's established by a charter and it has limited liability. Can sue and be sued can contract with third mm -hmm. parties. So if you compare the B to a SAC, what's the difference? A segregated account. Sorry, you were muffling for me. I didn't hear the question. Oh, I said compare the B to a SAC. I didn't, I didn't get that, I'm sorry. Compare the B, compare B to, to a SAC. Uh -huh. What's the difference between the two? The SAC is regulated. Correct, it's normally used for which business? Um, fund, funds. Funds, okay. So it's for different purposes. What else? What makes it different? Besides its use. It has a share capital. The SAC has a share capital. Mm -hmm. Know what the difference is? It's just, um, well, the B is established by a charter, whereas the SAC has proper constitutional documents like in like M and A's. Mm -hmm. Does the SAC have the end with the words executive entity? No. Okay, so that's another difference. Under, under, under the B, the, the, the consul 
has the power to access the books, the records, and the accounts. So on a segregated account, can you go and check the records and accounts of all of the SACs? No. No. They're only relevant to whoever is, because the SAC is particular to each person or each. Correct. Yeah, its own structure. It's all right. So now we get in the hang of how this thing works, what the exam question will look like. So executive entity could have a charter or you could have articles, anyone. Mm -hmm. Can you repeat that, sorry? Executive entity can be by a charter or by articles. Mm -hmm. But it has a separate legal personality. Okay, so then we do trust versus foundation. We did foundation versus a PT. So we know the, okay, what makes a trust valid? The three certainties. Ah, there we go, which are? Certainty of uh objects certainty of intent and certainty of subject matter okay and the laws that govern trust business are let's see who's been reading the trustee act uh-huh anything else No other act? No? That's the only act you remember? Were there any acts at the end of the chapter? PTC act? No, I'm talking about the trust act. That's the section on trust. Oh. Did you see some other legislation mentioned there? No, it's just the trustee act and any amendments. Okay, there are some other ones. You have the Fraudulent Disposition Act, Choice of Governing Law Act. So what's the duty of a trustee? To have the um, interest of the beneficiaries, the best interest of the beneficiaries and protect their interests. Uh-huh, what else? Asset protection. Mm-hmm. Uh, when you say asset protection, remember now, protect and preserve the trust property. Protect and preserve the trust property. Property, uh-huh. Um, estate planning purposes. Yeah, but that's not a duty now. No. Remember what I said now, once you become a trustee, you become a fiduciary. And a fiduciary means that you're going to act on behalf of the beneficiary. Someone. Right. In this sense, this is the beneficiary. And just by being a fiduciary, you always have to act in the best interest of the trust and make your decisions as the best financial decision for the beneficiaries. So remember, I was telling you, you could create a trust by walking into a trust company and say, I want to create a trust. A trust could be created whereby someone could come to you and say, I want you to hold this in trust for me. Or a trust can be created when someone in their will writes as one of their clauses, 
I hereby establish a trust for my children in the amount of so-and-so to be managed by a professional trustee or to be paid out as income every quarter or every year, the sum of $500, $300, or a sum as determinable by my trustees. But with that, with that function as a trustee, you have certain duties. So if you remember last week, I was telling you that if you are an executor of a will, and just by being in that role, you have an element of being a fiduciary because you have a responsibility to gather all of the trust assets of the deceased and ensuring that they are distributed in accordance with the will. But in particular, when you establish a trust and you have a trustee, that trustee have to, one of their main function is to invest. And they have to invest in a timely manner. So when they take on a trust, they have to make sure that they invest right away. Why? Because if there is a delay, the beneficiaries will scream breach of trust and they will want to sue you. Then they also have that duty to keep the beneficiaries informed. That means having the accounts ready and tabled every time they ask for it. And then when it comes to the trust assets, a trustee cannot make a personal profit and he cannot be in conflict with the trust. So all, all of these are his duties that come with taking on a trust as a trustee, which is a fiduciary one. So even though he can't delegate his duties, our trustee act allow him to go out and engage an agent to carry on functions on his behalf. But he must do that under the provisions of the law which means that he has to make sure that the person has the requisite skills and knowledge and experience to carry out that function. Ring the bell to everybody? Yes. Okay. So there are different types of trusts. So let's start with Tessa. Explain one of them to Shalisa and Darcy. There's the irrevocable trust which means it cannot be revoked. So uh -huh. it means that they can't, like once it's established, it just exists and it can't be amended or changed. Okay. Let's go, Danielle. So um, contrary to the irrevocable trust, there's a revocable trust. You're doing all the easy ones. <laughs> but, no, but I, I wanted to also add that a revocable trust can become irrevocable, but a revocable yes. trust cannot become revocable if you wanted to change the terms of the trust instrument. It can only Agreed. go- Agreed, yes. Say that again. So you said the revocable trust can become irrevocable, but yeah. it cannot be vice versa. Right. Like if you were to amend the terms of the trust deed, an irrevocable trust will always you be- can, Yeah, you can't change it. But you can change a revocable trust if you have the power to do so to um, a irrevocable trust. That's a discretionary trust. Mm-hmm. That a directed trust. Where the investments of the trust asset are left to the discretion of the trustees. Yes. Do, do they understand what they mean by discretion? Shalisa, you understand what discretion means? She going quiet. Can you explain it for me, Playa? No, I, I'm also helping my son with his homework. Oh. So I'm okay. listening and, and trying to okay. try. To... All right. So discretion means that once the trustees is managing the assets through the investments. He has income beneficiaries and he has capital beneficiaries. So the income beneficiaries would receive their payments from 
the dividends or the interest that are coming in on the actual assets. So what the trustee has to do now is he has to make a decision. Number one, who he, who he is going to pay? How much is he going to pay? And when is he going to pay it for the income beneficiaries? The same thing for the capital beneficiaries, there may be requests for advancements. He has to decide one, if he's going to grant it, two, how much is he going to grant? Three, when will he grant it? All of his deliberations and coming to this decision cannot be seen by the beneficiaries. It is confidential. So what's a, what's a part discretionary part fixed interest trust? We said, what are the, the terms of a fixed interest trust? A part, this discretionary part fix. Remember the part discretionary part fix has to do with dealing with a class of beneficiaries. Remember when I said that? A class could be all my nephews, all my nieces. Yeah. That's the class. A non-discretionary fixed interest trust is what? Oh, oh that means it's um, specified in the trust deed how much um, the beneficiary is supposed to benefit from the trust and at what age or what terms they had to meet in order to um, receive a benefit from it. Right. And because so, it is a fixed interest trust, they can enforce it because they know that is what they're getting. Right. So if it's like um, upon attaining the age of 30 or graduating from X, Y, and Z or getting married, then they get a certain amount or it's just they get a, a specified amount each month or quarter. Quarter, yes. Or what and it can be enforced. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So who could be a trustee? All of us. Are you sure we all have some of mine? <laughs> <laughs> Not all the time. <laughs> That's one of the key things. You have to have a sound mind and you cannot be bankrupt. Why do you think you can't be bankrupt? Individual, it would have to be two, but if um, yeah, we need two trustees, but if it's a financial institution, you only need one. Okay. How many trustees are, are you allowed to have by law? As many as you want, I don't know. Really? I think a minimum. Really? Four. It's four. Okay. That's the max? Yes, four. That's the max trustee. Mm -hmm. Is that including um, institutional trustees? An institutional trustee is classified as one. So that's why sometimes you get up two institutional trustees, but you don't want institutionalized, you don't want more than one or more than two, because then you're gonna have conflicts and never come to a decision. And a lot of fees. And there's a lot of fees, yes. So if you are an individual trustee versus a, a corporate trustee, is the knowledge and the expectations the same? Yes. No. 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 A professional trustee is, is treated at a higher standard yep. than an individual. But they would still have the same duties. Yeah, but it's a company. So they have they can spread it more. Mm. Yep. Yeah. So the cost will go much harder on a licensee who is regulated versus an individual who is a trustee. So they're at, they're at a higher standard. Normally as a, as a trustee, they normally say that you exercise your, your duty and your care and your skill as an ordinary prudent man would do. 
which means anybody on the street who has some money and they want to invest it, that's what they compare you to. When you're a company, it is a much higher regard because they're looking at all of the amount of knowledge that you can pull from all of your employees and your access to better agents than a standalone person. So in the notes, remember it said that the trustees' responsibilities are very onerous and they are time consuming and they require a lot of attention and care because you have to protect and preserve the assets of the trust and at the same time invest it so that you can pay the income beneficiaries and their assets remaining for the remainder mine. So normally in the trust business, they do have insurance to cover the full liability, but they will not and cannot insure you for your willful conduct or your negligence. So how do you appoint a trustee? Normally at the beginning of a trust when it's created. Or when if the settler, trustee, go ahead. When the settler transfers his assets to the trustee and um, they complete the relevant trust document. Okay. And he signs over the he signs over the property to the trustee. Mm -hmm. And you could also have a have a, a trustee when one dies or they retire or they've been removed. And then depends, you can always add another trustee. But remember, what's the paramount document when you're talking about trust administration? What's the paramount document? The document that, that drives everything that the trustee does. The trustee. The trustee. And from the trustee, where else does he go for support? The trustee act. The trustee act, correct. And as the trustee, is it required to be paid? No, no. not all the time. No. It has to be uh, stipulated in the trustee, right? Right. And that clause is called a, I heard it just now. What is uh -huh. it? Remuneration clause. No, charging. charging. It's called a charging clause. clause. Charging clause. So that's why the trustee has to make sure that the trust instrument includes a provision for them to be paid. And they can also add into that some reasonable expenses. So once he has, he's investing the assets of the trust and he is getting income, he is managing capital, issuing advances when necessary, he must always, always act in the best interest of the beneficiaries. And he has to treat them all fairly and impartially. And then he has to balance the interest because if he doesn't balance the interest between the income beneficiaries under a remainder man, he's going to be sued for breach of trust. So always remember, once the assets are uh, transferred to the trustee and he has ensured that all of the assets have been reconveyed according to which type of assets they are, the equitable interest rests with the beneficiaries and that equitable interest give the beneficiary the right to information and of course the right to sue and that right to information is a right it's established in the section 83 of the trustee act but it's also a right under common law but of course, our law stipulates what the beneficiary can and cannot see. And in common law, 
they do speak about what a beneficiary cannot see. So it's only the beneficiaries, because they have this right, they can sue the trustees. Or they can bring any action regarding the administration of the trust. But always be mindful that a beneficiary cannot dictate to the trustees how to administer the trust. And if one of the beneficiaries is the set law and the set law is dictating to the trustees how to manage the assets of the trust and he has retained certain powers or he acts as if he still owns the property, it will be declared a sham. So normally it's the trustee's duty to make sure that the trust is run as smooth as possible. Consulting with the protector when necessary. Arranging his meetings on time and distributing to the income beneficiaries when payments are due. Any questions? I hear quiet. Why is that? I would like to go back to the differences between the companies because I feel like this is going to be very important later <laughs> down the line. And I feel <laughs> like I could use some more reviewing on that. Which one? When we were discussing the founder and PTC and then like the trust and the PTC. Mm -hmm. I think one of the, let me just look back. The best, way, the best way to do this until we do the review for the exam, you tell you how I tell the other students to do it. Normally we're in a classroom. So what we normally do is we take a sheet on the left hand side, we write the, the normal features of a company. At the very top, you put a company, a regular company. You put a charitable trust, NGO. Then you put a trust, you put a foundation, you put a PTC, and you put executive entity. And then for each one of the items on the left-hand side, you put whether it's applicable or not. If it's not, then you indicate what is applicable. That's the easiest way to do it. And normally most people who prepare that, they normally get the question right. Because what they can do is they can actually draw on a scrap paper, that whole grid, and they just look to see which two or three entities I've chosen and they can do it. Most people for the final exam get that question right. Because it doesn't require any words. It just requires you to know the difference between them. And looking at the key features of a company and comparing it to each one of these entities. So that'll take care of those. Or if I give you one on advantages and disadvantages between certain entities, you should be able to answer that too. So that's a different, a different question. But normally it's the comparison between different entities. Or I could give you a structure and ask you to explain why. Why is this structure um, beneficial to the beneficiaries or to the settler law who's actually created this for preservation of wealth. So I could have a foundation, then I could have a PTC, 
I could have an executive entity on the side, then I could have a trust below, and I could have an operating company. And you need to explain each one. I don't like to worry about exams. Same time to worry yet. It's too soon. All right, any other questions? 457, uh oh. Now my papers are mixed up. So what are we doing next week? Investments. So we add that, but investments are a little bit different. Investment funds. We need to be familiar with the with the changes that were made in the recent legislation. All of the requirements. Now, somebody asked me a question last week about Airbnb. Where's that question? Who asked a question about Airbnb? I think we were discussing Airbnbs and whether they had to pay that. What was it? That on their income. Okay. So under the BAT Act Amendments 2019, they inserted a new subsection. Under section four, they inserted a new subsection two. And then they say on a supply of real property that is not zero rated, is subject to such conditions as may be prescribed in regs and rules chargeable on the value of, of the supply at the rate specified in the third schedule. And they actually have a brand new third schedule. So if you look at this amendment, you will see that Airbnb are included under real property. Uh, um, I'm gonna tell you right now what the definition is. So is that because it's considered commercial property then if it's- um... It didn't say that. It's a, in, they say, where is it? Airbnb, real property holdings. So then they would be required to get a TIN number. Yes, ma'am. They need a business license and, VAT and Department of Inland Revenue um, VAT registration certificate. It says your vacation home rental means a residence that is offered as a short-term rental for a continuous period, not exceeding 45 days. So that's one criteria. So if you meet that criteria then you fall under this section, this new section of the act. And whether or not you are, you, um, you are to be charged VAT, that decision can be made by the Department of Inland Revenue. This new, these new um, sections inserted gives them the authority to assess whether or not they can collect VAT from you on your real property. This also includes when you get property as a gift when someone dies. There's a certain period um, after you get a gift. If you if you if you take that property and you sell that property onto someone else within seven years, they have to pay VAT. You have to pay VAT on that. So if you sell inherited property mm -hmm. within seven within seven years. years. You're liable to pay back. Okay. So what, how does it, um, how, what if it's owned by a company or a trust? And it's renting, like the trust is renting out. That's the question you asked. Let me see. There's something here 
See, the, the problem with this is you have to pull the main aft and then insert it. It did speak to trusts. It speaks to trusts. Yeah, okay. Let me see if I can find that section. Zero rated. I think the best thing is to call the Department of Inland Revenue. And then oh, how no. how is it enforced? Like what if what if it's owned by a company that's owned by a trust and there's no TIN number or VAT being paid? Yeah, but the onus is the onus is on you to go to the Department of Inland Revenue. Because it says your collection of VAT on supply of real property. It says it shall be the responsibility of the controller to assess and collect VAT payable on the supply. Okay, so let me see. That's the intervivos gifts. Okay, so security under mortgage. I know I saw it in here. And then they have penalties too. See. Okay, so it says here, this is amendment to the first schedule. It says the first schedule to the act is amended by the insertion of the following. Subject to the VAT rules, the following supplies of real property. What do you see? An individual's gift of real property that is held by the transferee for at least seven years from the date of the transfer, where there is no change in beneficial ownership, or the only transferees are a trustee, where the express and unalterable terms of the trust instrument permanently excludes every person except for the transferor the transfer of spouse, parents, children are a motor issue from taking or receiving any title to the trust property. So what you're talking about is not that. That's death. No, it's talking about Dawa. It has it, it has it in the definition, but I don't see it here. All it says that if, okay, the third schedule says every deed of conveyance, long-term lease, assignment, or transfer of real property, you have to pay that. Two and a half percent, where the value is a hundred thousand and under, and 10% if it exceeds a hundred thousand. But I don't think if you do B and B, I don't see how it falls under, under the schedule because you're not transferring any interests out of Airbnb. Because Airbnb is just like renting an apartment. I don't see it because all of these are speaking to either a, a mortgage or a transfer, a reconveyance of real property or an endorsement of a mortgage. But then it says any other supply, but again, again, it's a large amount, two and a half percent of a hundred thousand. So I don't see where it explicitly states what's the rate for Airbnb, even though they refer to it. I don't see it in here. Less is hidden somewhere in the uh, in the main act.
But according to this, it says you have to have a business license before you come to VAC to get a registration certificate. So I guess the first step you have to do is try to get a business license. And I guess depending on the value, then they'll determine whether or not you actually need to go to VAC. Right. Because you know the threshold for that is a hundred thousand. So if your lease is not doesn't meet the threshold in a year's time, then you probably don't don't have to pay that. But they will determine that. Because it says a real property holding, like who's holding the assets, the actual property. It could be a company under the IBC or the companies are. It could be a partnership. It could be an association. It could be a trust or it could be an incorporated or unincorporated entity. Any one of those that own property is covered by this amendment in 2019. A long-term lease is a lease of five or more years. So normally for, normally for a bed and breakfast, how long is the lease? The bed and breakfast are similar to like hotels, aren't they short? Yeah, but this thing says 40, how many days I told you? Less than 45 days or 48, Less than was it 48? 45, 45. 45. So you know where I'm not term five years, that's extremely long. Sometimes you only mm -hmm. rent an apartment for a year or two years. So short so vac considered... vacation rental home is residence offered as a short term rental for a continuous period not exceeding 45 days. Okay. So it can be held by a trust or a partnership. So if you exceed 45 days, then I guess you move into, into a lease. Because there's nothing else here. For a continuous period, not exceeding 45 days. So I guess they look at the nature of the contract itself to see how much you're gonna be making in a year to see if you meet the $100,000 threshold. Because it depends on how much you're renting it for. If at the end of the year, would it be a hundred thousand? It depends. Because some people out best are are on renting homes as Airbnb for ten, twelve, fifteen thousand dollars a month. Yeah, even some of the bigger homes like on Eastern Road too, they rent for a lot on Airbnb because they're waterfront. Mm -hmm. So it depends on like location and like size and how long they do them, they're renting them for. They right, so, right, so at the end of the day, when they add it up, they're gonna say that it falls underneath the category of being taxable supplies. because of the amount. But the onus, the onus is on, on you to first get the business license if you fall within that category. And then they will, that will do an assessment and determine. And what you don't want is if you fall within the threshold and then when they come to do the assessment, you haven't paid for a number of years, it makes it worse because you're gonna be fined. Well, that's your starting point right there. Got the contract, see how much you're gonna make for the year. And if it's gonna meet the threshold, you need to apply for a business license. And then you go to the Department of Inland Revenue. So if it's below the threshold, then you say you don't need to pay that? 
Well, according to the schedule at the back, it all starts at, hold on, let me see, no, third schedule. Let me see how it's worded. On the third schedule, it says, hold on. It's two and a half percent where the value is 100,000 and under. So it goes under. So, yeah, all of them are and under. So it goes under 100,000. I guess, and because this property is not like other services. Yeah, I think you're gonna have to register. I wonder if there's any valuation. I can find out. Airbnb. How much? How much your lease is? Under forty-five days. Yeah. A year. So, on an annual basis, how much do you make? Under the threshold of a hundred. Okay, so less than a hundred k. Be like 36, 40. Okay. So you want to know, I use required for business license plus VAC, correct? Yeah. Okay. And these um, at least two foreigners, non residents? Uh, no, I would say all Bahamian. All, all Bahamians. Bah Okay, less than a hundred thousand. Okay, all right. See if I could get this for you for next week. Thanks. I'll call some people up back. Let's see what they say. I have the amendment right in front of me, so thanks. I could find out. That would be great. Thank you. Okay, and it's owned by a trust, right? Trust and company. What do you mean? Well, two trust. separate issues, yeah. One's involving a trust and one's involving a company that's owned by oh, a trust. okay, okay. Yeah. Both so, ultimately owned by a trust. Okay, okay, all right. But there's a company underneath the trust. Yeah. Okay, all right. Okay, and then I'll find out for you. The one that's um, directly by the trust, does the trust get a TIN number, you know, like? Okay. I don't know. So the trust owns this property, but mm -hmm. is actually leasing it out. Yeah. Mm. And that makes the same amount of money? Yes, under the threshold, very small amounts. Mm, okay. Okay. And the other one is through a company. Yeah, and the company is owned by a trust. Yeah, I got it. Thanks. Okay. Any other questions? Not at the moment, thank you. Okay, well, I told you, well, last week you we said it was early, but we didn't end early. We didn't. <laughs> so we did tonight. Yeah, this is early tonight. Yes, it is early. So next week we're going to do investment funds. Are you, is it going to be a quick session or is it going to be like a nice lengthy one? Why? Because I think, I, I'm hoping that it is because I won't be able to participate at least if I rewatch it online at another time, I'll be able to get a nice full understanding of what I missed. Oh, but it's gonna be recorded anyhow, you forget Miguel records it. Yeah. Yeah, Miguel records it, so don't stress yourself like that. He'll have, he'll, he'll upload it. And if he doesn't yeah, upload it, just send him a note and then he'll upload it for you. 
Yeah. So you don't have to I stress. Know investment, I know investment funds will have a lot more detailed, similar to like the trust zone. That's why I say like, um, if it's going to be like a little bit more of in-depth review. Yeah, but in, in this one, we're looking more at the changes to the legislation for investment funds. Okay. Yeah. So it'll be a little bit, yeah, it's a little bit more detailed. Okay. Yeah. All right. So all of you who did not read, you need to read because we are doing investment funds. And then after that was the next topic. I didn't put a number on that one. It was investment funds along. We do the icon. We have investment funds and the icon together. So the icon is another creature that we have from the civil jurisdiction. So we probably do the icon first because it's shorter and then we'll do the investment funds. Okay. All right, yo. Thanks, Ms. Archer. You get an early Thank night, you. you can rest now. <laughs> <laughs> Next week, y'all will be supercharged. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so y'all Sonic, y'all dead. <laughs> Indeed. Oh, boy. Like y'all can hardly make it. Like, you know, like I'm pulling teeth. <laughs> Most of this time, I've been in my car. I've been in Sabaro. I've been all over the place trying to listen no to wonder. this. <laughs> no wonder you ain't checking for me. <laughs> it ain't a guy checking. I just have to listen because I got off work. I didn't get out of work until even later than I try and leave at six, but uh -huh. I didn't get out until like almost six forty this evening. Oh, okay, okay, all right. I forgive you then. I forgive you, but I just say, "Tay, just not awake today. What happened?" But I know work because I was rushing to. When I got when I got home inside, it was already five forty-two. So yeah. I understand. All right, so we will chat next week. Let me tell Miguel, and we're good to go. But I'll look up your answers for you tomorrow. See what I can get for you. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Thank you, good and night. good night. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Yes. Mm. Okay.